Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. I hope you sang that last verse, that last sentence. I am a child of God. You think about what that means. As we look at the verse, verses we're going to look at today out of Joshua, I want to kind of, I want that to echo in your minds and in your hearts. But kind of to get started, I have a question I want you to think about. I'm sure we all do this. Do you ever choose sides? No matter whether it's in an argument or a football game or whatever's going on, we tend to want to choose sides. We tend to want to be on the winning side. We want to be right. But as we look at choosing sides, uh, you know, you a lot of football games going on this week. I hear everybody talk about their team. Boy, they want to be the winner. They want to be the one that doesn't lose. So they're, they pick and choose carefully, I guess, of what they want to be. If you, if you change the TV and you change it to a news station, Kind of got to pick which side you're on there, too. I think some of the news stations are going to tell you what they want you to know or what they, what they want you to think and believe. You got a choice across the board of what you want to believe so you know where to turn the channel if you want somebody that believes what you believe. So we have that option, too. But as we look at this, I titled this today, Three Sides to Every Story. Because a lot of times, even I know as a parent, Working with kids, if my kids ever got into an argument, I'd talk to them about it, and one side would tell me one thing, and the other side would tell me another. didn't even seem like they were part of the same situation because the facts were what they wanted to focus on. They wanted me to know what, what would help me to be on their side. And the other one would tell me what he wanted me to know, that he wanted me to be on their side, and I think that's human nature. That... In our minds, we make these choices and we want to be right. And we want to know that as we live our lives, we're on the right side. But as we look at this scripture today, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up. We're going to stand and read. We're going to cover, look at the entire chapter today. It's verse 15 verses. But I want to focus on one certain section. But as we read together, let's stand together in the honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to begin with verse 13. It says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up and asked him, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this scripture. And Lord, as we study this day, as we ask questions, as we seek to know what you want us to know, Lord, open our minds and our hearts. Give us the wisdom to know how to follow you. Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking at Joshua. Part of what got them to this point is where they had gotten to the Jordan. They had been wandering for a few years, as we know, 40 years. And they had been waiting on God to move, waiting on following God to where He was leading them. Because God had made a covenant with them, made a promise with them. And as they, He was doing this, he was waiting on them also. So it was kind of a back and forth situation, but as they were going through this, God had brought them across the Jordan. I don't know if you know much about the Jordan, but it is a river. And they had to get across. They needed a safe path to get across. And at this time of the season, they said it was kind of overflowing its banks. In other words, at flood stage. So if you want to know about the kind of miracle God was doing and taking at this time, Next time we're at flood stage down here on the Potomac and the Shenandoah, walk down there and look at the water coming by. 
Because I know a lot of times when I read and think about the miracles that I see in the Bible, sometimes I think I take them for granted. We've read so many miracles about mighty works that God has done and continues to do, but we almost just kind of think, you know, that's Him. So sometimes we lose the ability to be in awe of who God is as He works these miracles. And as we study His Word and as we look at what it means and what He's done for His people from the beginning, beginning of time until now and can, will continue to do so. But as we look at chapter 5, we're going to begin with verse 1. It says, Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Can- Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan, Before the Israelites, until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Um, Just the idea of him blocking the waters, as I talked about. What he had done, the, the priest had the Ark of the Covenant, were walking with it, and as they walked to the edge of the water, said the water backed up. It stopped, and it gave them a dry place to cross. They said the priest walked out, continued to hold the Ark of the Covenant, and God had told them he, that is where he would be. And that is where he would protect them. That is where he would keep the land dry as they did all he commanded them to do. Because not only did he want them to be able to cross, he also wanted them to remember, and for future generations to remember, the miracle that he performed. So he told them while they were in crossing Today they were to take the twelve stones and to build a monument and to build something to remember this time, this miracle. Because in the future, he wanted people to be able to remember and see what he had done for the Israelites. So he had performed this miracle, and then as they crossed through and they came out, the water restored. The river was back to flowing over its banks and down. So as others looked at this and saw the miracle, they were in awe. But three things I want to look at as we start with this verse, and three kind of questions. But consider the power of God, the Jordan, the river. I know a lot of times, like I say, we read about these and we think, yeah, God God did a miracle. But Think about the process. Not only of the Jordan, not only of the power that He showed there, but think about throughout history and even in this day how God answers prayers. And God provides for what we need, what His people need. Because He had called the Israelites into a covenant. You will be my children and I will be your God. You will be my people, I will be your God. So He had made a covenant with them. So He was in the process this whole time of providing for what they needed, and we'll look at a couple of other points. But consider the power of God. Not only back then of the Jordan, but what we see God doing today. Because God continues to work in our own life. And like I said, I'm probably the worst about taking things for granted. The fact that I'm standing here and breathing and blood is pumping through my veins, that is a miracle. God created us. God set this in motion, and we get up every day and we might complain about an ache or a pain. But we don't think about the process of what God is doing in our life as we live. As our heart pumps and as our lungs fill with air and He blesses us day by day. But that miracle that He gives us, consider the power of God. And as we sit here and we say, I am a child of God. Think about what that means for us. We have a heavenly Father, a loving God that is able to do wondrous and mighty things that has made a covenant with us that He will be our Father. He will be our God. And we will be His people. So as we think about that, think about the power of God in the Jordan, but the second thing, consider the respect the world holds for God. And I know sometimes we argue this point. But consider the respect the world holds for God because it said when the kings heard what God was doing, their hearts melted. They were filled with fear. They didn't want to face the Israelites. They lost their courage because they knew who God was. They knew what He was doing and they knew they could not defeat that. 
And they had a respect for Him that far exceeds what a lot of us walk around with a a respect for God that we should have, that we need to have. So the world around us knows who God is because it says in Scripture there comes a time that every one of us within our heart has to make a decision about who we believe God to be. And that's what He calls us to. So we have that information, we have that knowledge, and we have to make that decision. So I am hoping that we, as we look at the number three point, because this is a hard question to deal with sometimes. Some days are better than other. Consider the respect you hold for God. Just talked about the respect the world holds. But what about us personally? Who do we see God as to be? An almighty heavenly Father that's the creator of all, that does everything that He does, all the miracles we know of? Or do we treat Him like He's a good luck charm when we need Him? God, things are not going right. Could you help? I need you. God calls us to live moment by moment for Him. And we see that here because we move on into the next part of it. Verse 2 through 5. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. So there's two generations here. The first generation is the one that he brought out of Egypt, that they celebrated that they were getting away, that he was leading them to where he had promised. And all those had been circumcised, and circumcision was a physical commitment to follow God a surgical procedure to commit to follow God. And I think back now, or back to those times and the kind of the difference now, we now walk an aisle and we're baptized. So I think things are a little easier for us now. But to follow God back then, they had made the commitment, they had taken that covenant. And they were saying, God, we respect what you've called us to be. And we're going to honor it. We're going to obey it. So he set that journey in motion. But as they were wondering and they were waiting, all of those who had come along afterwards, who had been born since then, 40 years, had kind of gotten away from taking that commitment, making that covenant. And God saw that. So God told him the second part of this, the new generation that was coming along, the one that he was going to replace the originals with because of their disobedience. He wanted them to restore that covenant and that commitment. So all of them took that commitment, took that step. So we see the, new, the old generation lost the, or stepped away from the covenant. The new generation stepped into it but it was part of the journey and it was the process of them being who they were going to be. Now God created them for a purpose and God had a plan for them and God called them to that plan. And He was with them all along, once again meeting their needs, giving them what they needed to survive. But as they got to this part, realized the process and the journey that it's continual, that they live it day by day and that the commitments stay. The promises stay. That it is not in God's nature to turn away from His covenant. And He expects us to stay with our part of our covenant, our obedience, our following Him, and being who He's called us to be. And the promise He has set before us. Verse 6, The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land He had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Consider God's timing. Do we have a part in it? Does God wait on me? Does God wait on you? 
think he does because he just showed us right here he was waiting for 40 years for them to get to where they needed to be, for them to become who they needed to become. He was giving them time. And I think about the times we pray for things and we want God to answer our prayer. We pray it today and hope when we get up in the morning it's taken care of. Or at least by the end of the week. But we look at God's timing and who He desires for us to be and I think not only does He have His time frame and His plan, but He waits on us. Because He needs us to know And He needs us to see. And He needs us to believe what we need to believe. We need to recognize God and His plan for who He is. So to me, I'm beginning to think that 40 years is not that long. That He's got a plan and He's waiting for that plan. And He's putting that plan and it's part of the journey. It's part of the process. And we have an opportunity to be a part of that. That God has called us and said, listen, this is my plan for you. But He waits on us. He waits to see about our obedience and our desire to follow. But the second part of that, consider being replaced in God's plan. I just sit here and said that He might wait 40 years. But I think this scripture shows us He might not. Because through this whole generation, they said the reason he's waiting is that for every man that came out of Egypt, even that had made that covenant and that commitment, what was he waiting on? For them to die out. Because they had stepped away from being obedient, they had quit following after what he had made part of the covenant. So their disobedience was part of that. But the third part, consider the cost of missing the blessing. Israelites, that first generation, didn't get to experience the promise of God. And I think God has a plan for each of us. He has desires. He has blessings that are in waiting for us as we are obedient and we live a life that's committed to Him. And I think at the moments we commit to being who we're supposed to be and we live out in obedience and we do those things and we follow God, He continually continually blesses us. But I also think that when we run around and we forget about God and we chase our own pursuits and we chase our own desires, we we are telling God that maybe we want other things other than His blessings that don't mean as much. Because any blessing from God is something beyond measure that we will never comprehend or understand until you are in the process of seeing God at work in your own personal life. And as we see that and we understand that and we become who He desires us to be. Verse 7 through 9. So He raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained there, remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Three more points. I asked this a second ago. Do you have a replacement? Have you thought about that? Is God currently sitting waiting on you to be obedient? That He has a plan for you. He has desires to bless you. He wants you to be a part of His his calling, His work. And we hopefully have a desire to be part of that calling. But in our disobedience or our desire to ignore what He's calling us to be, and we pursue those other things, God will raise up a replacement. Now, I'm not talking about losing your eternal home in heaven. I'm talking about the blessings that God has for you every day in life. He's ready to put into your life. Let you be a part of that. I can tell you one that continues I think about quite often. The people that I'm praying about that I want to see come to know Christ. That I want to see have eternal salvation. I think about... If I do everything I should be doing, if I say all the things I should be saying, if I'm doing what God's called me to do, 
Or am I going to miss out on the blessing of seeing that decision made by someone because I'm off doing my own thing? God wants us to be daily committed, momentarily committed, second by second, minute by minute, day, day to day, every day of our lives, to be about His will. Second part of that second question, the covenant with God. They stepped away. The first generation stepped away. They stepped away from being obedient. God never stepped away. He raised up another generation. God was still committed to His covenant. He raised up a whole other generation to the promise that He had gifted, to the promise that He was ready. And then the last part of that, the blessing of God's covenant. The ones who missed out on it will never know. They'll never understand what God had planned for them. And I think day to day, sometimes we miss out on those same blessings. We'll never understand what God meant to do in our lives because we're too busy chasing after our own earthly desires. And we have to understand that His calling is something greater, that His plan is bigger than what this world has to offer, and that we continue, continue to pursue Him. Moving down to verse 10 through 12. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. This was the second miracle that I think too many times I read right by. The manna from heaven. Do we even understand that? They were in a place that they could not produce their own food. That they could not be fed and God fed them. God met a need that in common terms, in common sense, would not make sense to us. But God met that need for them in His way. Another miracle that sometimes I think we just read right through and walk right by as we study it and see it. Um, the act of obedience, the provision of heaven. Those two things kind of go together. The obedience that we have for God is living out His plan. And the provision that is needed is Him meeting those needs. And as we look at that and understand that and see that, we understand more about God. But this final part, this is the section that I kind of wanted to focus on and take a little bit of time with. Verse 13 through 15. It said, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us? Are you for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Five things I want to touch on here, and I want to take with us. Because as much as the Israelites sitting on the bank of the Jordan, as this describes them and its questions they needed answered, I think as Charlestown Baptist Church and Charlestown, West Virginia, and today is these same questions we need to answer. Because God gives us an opportunity to follow Him. But the things I want to look at, who is God for? I've heard many a people use that Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for me, who can stand up to me? And I think we lose the meaning of what that scripture is saying. I think we spend our lives trying to convince God how we're right. And He needs to be on our side. And He needs to listen to our prayers. And He needs to bring about what we want Him to bring about. 
It's not what that scripture is talking about. That scripture is saying when we line our hearts and our minds up with the things of God, nothing can stand against us. God's will, God's desire to be His people, us. And when we take on that role and we are, we are faithful in that, He provides. Second part of that, God's plan. We know what God's plan is. We, he created us to be His. We are to be in relationship with Him. Starting now. Starting when you accept what He's done through Jesus Christ. We are to be in relationship on a regular basis, day to day, minute to minute, with a loving Father. That's who He created us to be. That's His plan. Number three, a reverence for God. Do we ever lose this? I'll go ahead and tell you, I, I probably miss the boat on this a lot. Because God calls us to understand who He is and pursue who He is. And I tell you, my mind will never grasp the miracles of God and how He loves us and why He loves us and what He has done for us. I couldn't tell you why He's done it. But He has. And for us to have a reverence of, for God when we pray to know that we should be face down in awe, that we should worship Him with our words, with our statements, with everything we do, with everything we say. That should be our lives. That people around us could see the change in our hearts and the change in our lives because of our reverence for God. But I think as we look around and how the world looks at the church, the church, they see that maybe we don't have that reverence. We spend too much time arguing with each other, picking sides, trying to figure out who's right or who should do this or who should do that. And we have to get back to the reverence of God. Just had a discussion last week. We were talking about the fact, you know, eventually we'll get away from denominations and get back to Christianity. And quit arguing with each other and quit disagreeing and quit looking for someone to say we're right. But to have a reverence of God will bring us into that unity. But the fourth thing, an ear to hear. If you notice what Joshua said, what message do you have for me? He didn't say, I hope they're listening, so whatever you have to say, they'll listen and hear. Because they're not listening to me. When we get into a reverence of God and understanding that He has a plan for me, He has a relationship with me, God, what do you want me to hear? If we can get to the point of every single one of us living our lives each day, of God, show me what to be, what to do, how to be obedient, will change this world. But the last part of that, the presence of God. We are on holy ground. Why? Because we're in a sanctuary? No. Because you are in the presence of God. Because God says where we gather, where He is, He goes with us, He never leaves us alone. We are in the presence of God, which makes us on holy ground. It's nothing about being in a building, being in a monument. We talked about this last week. God doesn't want monuments, He wants our heart. He wants our relationship. He wants our love and how we show our love through our obedience to Him. So the commitment we make and we understand the presence of God and being on holy ground which brings us back to the original point. And I, thought, I realized through writing this my title was wrong. There's not three sides to every story. It's one. If we can get to being one side of the story and it focused on God and His glory and His plan and His desire will be who He called us to be. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for this Scripture. I thank You for the opportunity to study and to read. And Lord, I pray that You continue, Lord, just to drive our hearts to want to know You. 
Lord, you're an amazing God. You love us. You provide for us beyond what we could ever imagine. Lord, we take you for granted. I know we do. But Lord, I pray as individuals, as a church family, as ones who want to make a difference in this world, that you allow us to be obedient to you. And Lord, you don't replace us. That you allow us to be blessed because of what you have planned and that we want to follow you and we want to be your people and we want you to be our God. Lord, we love you. Help us to live lives that resemble that, that reflect that, that others may know and others may look and see and the world would look and see and know what an awesome God we serve because of the change they see. Lord, guide us in the days ahead as a church, as individuals, that we could reach the world, that others may come to know you through Jesus Christ. And Lord, just give us strength to do everything you call us to do. Don't let us wander. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for everything you bless us with. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to close today just with a time of prayer, an invitation. We're going to stand together. The altar will be open. If you would like to come forward and pray with someone, I'll be down here. You want to come to the altar and pray on your own. You're more than welcome. But let's stand together and sing. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office. 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.